Welcome to A Tale of Two Seaweeds With apologies to Charles Dickens Southern California is known for its incredible forests of giant kelp, Macrocystis periphera, which create a structured three-dimensional habitat in our nearshore waters. As a perennial species, this kelp usually persists year to year, and its astounding growth rate of up to two feet a day allows it to recover quickly from disturbance, thus creating a fairly stable habitat for marine life. These magnificent stands of seaweed support diverse communities of over 800 fish and invertebrates and 300 algae. Hey, don't forget us! This and their aesthetic beauty draws divers from all over the world to experience them. In a healthy kelp forest, giant kelp is usually the most important primary producer. Its surface canopy captures sunlight and utilizes it as an energy source to create carbohydrates through photosynthesis, which fuels its rapid growth. In turn, kelp provides food for many of the kelp forest residents. The somewhat open understory beneath the canopy permits the growth of many other species of algae that also provide food to herbivores and omnivores, which in turn are munched by predators. The complex ecosystem created by the species diversity in a healthy kelp forest conveys a greater stability to them. But giant kelp doesn't start out as a 200-foot-long alga. These giants, like the redwoods in Northern California, have a much more humble beginning as tiny microscopic stages on the ocean floor. The mature plants making up the forests produce tiny spores that eventually settle to the bottom. When conditions are right, the tiny spores develop into tiny male and female gametophytes which then fertilize and begin growth as a new sporophyte from the bottom, struggling to reach the surface where they can capture sunlight more readily. The primary growth of kelp occurs in winter and spring when water temperatures cool down and nutrient concentrations are higher. Kelp is normally healthiest during this period. As water temperatures increase in summer, nutrient levels drop, and kelp becomes nutrient-starved and begins to senesce, and surface canopy may die out. Under normal conditions, the kelp may persist in the cooler, deeper water and recover when temperatures drop again in late autumn. During the winter of 2005-2006, this dynamic changed. An exotic species known initially as Sargassum philocynum arrived on Catalina. It originally appeared in Long Beach Harbor in 2003, apparently traced to a single commercial vessel arriving from the Sado Inland Sea in Japan. This species had many of the characteristics of a weed in its ability to grow and disperse rapidly, and by the end of 2006, it had colonized many sites along the entire leeward coast of Catalina. It was aided by incredibly warm water temperatures that summer and fall, which decimated the giant kelp forest due to nutrient starvation. In Asia, this species, now known as Sargassum horneri, has natural controls in the form of abalone, urchins, and other herbivores. Sargassum possesses natural chemical defenses in the form of polyphenols, but the native species there have co-evolved with this alga and are able to feed on it. Here in Southern California, our abalone, sea urchins, and other herbivores evolved alongside the giant kelp and its tender, juicy blades. Sargassum probably leaves a somewhat bitter taste for them, so few local species feed on it. 
There have been several warm water episodes in the 10 years since it first appeared here that have illustrated the new dynamic in our Catalina ecosystems. In addition to the 2006-2007 warm water event, we experienced similar episodes in 2009-10, 2012-13, and again this past season. Without the shade from the giant kelp's canopy, the sargassum flourished and quickly dominated rocky reefs and even extended into soft-bottom habitats, creating a near monoculture that looks like amber waves of grain. During cooler water periods in other years, the kelp canopy persisted and overshadowed the sargassum, causing it to be a less dense component of the understory. The one fortunate thing is that sargassum horneri is an annual, completing its life cycle in less than a year. Once the gametophyte generation has shed its fertilized eggs, it begins to die out in the spring. At this important stage, the dye is cast. If temperatures are still cool at this point, giant kelp may recover. If not, the giant kelp may be inhibited and not grow back to any degree, allowing the sargassum to dominate again the following season. The past 12 months have witnessed an extreme warm water event. Kelp was greatly weakened by extremely high water temperatures ranging into the upper 70s, and the resultant precipitous drop in nutrients associated with water warmer than about 20 degrees centigrade or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Then in August, storm surge from Hurricane Marie added insult to injury and literally tore the weakened giant kelp out, leaving a landscape well suited for sargassum growth. Those kelp holdfasts that survived the storm often died due to lack of nutrients. The resulting landscape was dominated by sargassum, and even a casual look suggests a significant drop in biodiversity and therefore ecosystem stability. The impact of sargassum on other native seaweeds was also staggering. In November of 2014, diver Peter Van Aggs and I carefully cleared two large boulders of the sargassum. We were careful not to pull any native algae. Here you can see that the rocks beneath the thick sargassum growth were almost barren with hardly any native algae present under their dense growth. There has also been little growth of native species in the months since. Thus, the Casino Point Dive Park ecosystem was transformed substantially from a diverse assemblage of species to a greatly simplified ecosystem dominated by one species. The major primary producers switched from the delicious giant kelp to the not-so-tasty sargassum in a matter of weeks. Other native seaweeds were eliminated due to the sargassum's dominance in the competition for substrate to attach to, nutrients, and sunlight. When the primary producer level of an ecosystem is so radically altered, it often creates what is known as a bottom-up trophic cascade. With this nearly complete change in food sources, invertebrates and fish that feed on native kelp and other seaweeds are faced with a potentially radical change in diet. Abalone and sea urchins that feed on drift kelp found little of it reaching them. Many of the sea urchins had already died out due to the extremely warm water. However, I did find that I could feed sargassum to some abalone, primarily greens, as their normal food disappeared. Wavy top snails feed on trap giant kelp and understory seaweeds, but the domination by the sargassum limited these food sources, not to mention the extreme insult of having the sargassum grow attached to their shells, thus impeding their movement to less than a snail's pace. Norris's top snails do not seem abundant this year, since climbing up on sargassum is a more grueling task than ascending the giant kelp, and the sea hares which normally feed on red algae had little to eat and seemed to have disappeared. Another kelp eater I saw few of this season is the southern kelp crab. Not only were snails and other herbivores affected, the dense sargassum undoubtedly limits water circulation over the rocky reefs. Therefore, I believe filter feeders and suspension feeders like worms, barnacles, scallops, 
and other bivalves have had their food intake also restricted. There may be a slight offset since the thick sargassum may also limit the ability of reef predators such as male sheephead from locating their prey. They and other predators like octopus are also affected by the apparent decline in numbers of herbivorous snails they consider a delicacy. Nocturnal predators such as large kelp bass and mores must also find it difficult to locate prey in the thick sargassum. I've noticed lobsters sticking to the high ground to avoid entanglement in the sargassum, and some local commercial lobstermen say they are experiencing a horrible season. I've also wondered how this trophic change is affecting spawning by bottom-dwelling critters. Certainly the sargassum must limit the spread of gametes when abalone spawn. The brittle star Ophiodurma likes to climb up high on the reef so its gametes spread far and wide, but climbing to the top of the sargassum is almost impossible for them. And for those species that successfully spawn, how does the sargassum affect the settlement of their larvae? Of course, there are a few kelp traders in our midst. The giant kelp fish seems to have abandoned its namesake and is adapted to the sargassum to hide in and make its nests in. Even kelp bass use it for shelter since the giant kelp affords very little protection these days. And a few species like opali and senorita seem to have adapted to feeding on it, although more so late in its growing season when polyphenol production may have declined and many invertebrates are encrusting the sargassum, thus adding extra protein. What about the impacts on plankton feeders such as blacksmith and baitfish? Certainly the lower nutrient levels in warm water affect plankton growth, so food must be limited. The absence of giant kelp gives plankton feeders fewer places to hide, making them more vulnerable to predators such as cormorants and yellowtail, which have remained here through the winter. Based on my observations from the last 10 years, it looks like we are faced with a new dynamic in our kelp forests. In years when summer temperatures are cool to normal, giant kelp may persist and the sargassum be mostly restricted to a less dense understory alga. However, when temperatures are above normal, especially through the water column, the giant kelp forests may thin out or disappear completely, allowing the sargassum to dominate. When this occurs, giant kelp may not recover quickly unless holdfasts at depth remain healthy and allow new growth as the nutrients increase again. Sadly, the sargassum often leaves a largely barren landscape after it dies out in spring. Sometimes a virtual monoculture of young macrocystis will appear in this void. Unfortunately, sometimes the juvenile kelp begins growing on the dying sargassum stipes and drifts away as the Asian annual dies. Many attempts have been made to try to control this species. Unfortunately, California Department of Fish and Wildlife regulations limit an individual diver to removing just 10 pounds of wet weight per day, and that requires a valid fishing license. When facing the threat of this invader in a Marine Protected Area, or MPA, getting a permit for any removal is far more difficult. In part, this is due to poorly written language in the enabling legislation, the Marine Life Protection Act, which does not distinguish between native and non-native species in MPAs. If indeed the future holds a trend towards increasing ocean temperatures, the balance between the giant kelp and the sargassum may tilt toward the sargassum. It may be too late to take any effective action except in localized areas. The MPAs, which are supposed to serve as refugia or reservoirs for native species that can then disperse out into unprotected areas, would seem to be prime candidates for such efforts. Although I am a scientist by training, much of what I've reported here is anecdotal and based on my own observations and those of others. As such, it should be treated as speculation or hypothesis. Decision makers may require data-driven scientific studies to take action.
Unfortunately, by then I'm afraid it will be too late to save some of our giant kelp forests.